So in this chapter, we're going to talk about antimicrobial drugs. So in order for us to understand about antimicrobial drugs, we first need to start by introducing some terms. And the first term that we're going to refer to is chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is the treatment of disease with chemical substances. That's a very broad definition. Think about when you think of chemotherapy, what usually comes to mind that we associate with chemotherapy? And that is probably the first thing that comes to your mind is cancer treatment, right? Cancer treatment, patients will undergo chemotherapy. But what you need to realize is that chemotherapy is much more broad than that. It's not limited to cancer. It's basically the treatment of any disease with a chemical substance. So an antibiotic would be a type of chemotherapy. What is an antibiotic? An antibiotic is an antimicrobial agent usually produced by a bacterium or a fungus. And bacteria and fungi produce this as a defense mechanism, basically to help inhibit the growth of other competitors in their environment. And so what you'll see is many of the antibiotics that we use are actually naturally occurring and they're produced by bacteria and fungi. And so that's an antibiotic. If you think of antibiotics, are antibiotics typically useful against viruses? And the answer is no. We don't take an antibiotic for the cold or the flu because viruses are different than bacteria. And so when we start to talk about the mechanisms of antibiotics, you'll start to see why they're not effective against viruses. Viruses are different in their structure, in the way that they reproduce, etc. And so antibiotics are typically not effective against viruses. The next term we need to understand is selective toxicity. And selective toxicity is the property of some antimicrobial agents to be toxic to a microorganism and less or non-toxic to the host. And so when looking for antibiotics, you want to choose a drug that displays selective toxicity because you want it to target some aspect of the microbe without harming the host or without harming our own cells. And so throughout the semester, we've talked about different examples of selective toxicity, but one that we've talked about multiple times would be looking at penicillin. Penicillin inhibits peptidoglycan. It inhibits the cell wall. Prokaryotic cells like bacteria have cell walls made of peptidoglycan in the most, for the most part. So if we target peptidoglycan, we are inhibiting cell wall synthesis in bacteria, but do our cells have cell walls made of peptidoglycan? And the answer is no. Our cells are animal cells. They lack a cell wall. So penicillin is going to display selective toxicity. It's going to inhibit the microbe or harm the microbe without, um, without harming our own cells. And so selective toxicity is a very important property when choosing an antibiotic. So antibiotics are natural metabolic products of bacteria and fungi and they're produced to inhibit the growth of competing microbes in the same hab habitat. This would be antagonism. So again, it's their kind of defense mechanism. Think of it as their immune response, ex except it's not in response to anything in, in particular, but it's a chemical that they produce to basically inhibit other bacteria from um, growing in their habitat. The greatest numbers of antibiotics are derived either from bacteria in the genre um, Streptomyces and Bacillus, or molds in the genre Penicillium and Cephalosporium. And so if we look at this table, you do not need to memorize this table, but what you wanna look at and see is that if you look here, so here are gram positive rods. So Bacillus subtilis, we've worked with this one in lab, B. subtilis produces bacitracin. We have polymyxin. And so we are going to talk later about what these drugs do. If you look at um, actinomycetes, 
Notice we have Streptomyces. Streptomyces is a type of bacteria that is filamentous. It grows in these filaments, um, so it's fungi-like. Uh, we have many drugs that are derived from this, so amphotericin B, which is effective against uh, fungal, fungal growth, um, chloramphenicol, tetracycline. Uh, if we come down here, we have erythromycin, neomycin, etc. If we look at our fungi, some of the antibiotics are produced by fungi. And so penicillium chrysogenum produces penicillin. And you might recall that we talked about Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin completely by accident, right? He was trying to grow Staph aureus and on his plate, he ended up with this fuzzy fungi and he noticed that in the area where that fungi was, that bacterial growth was inhibited. And so we are gonna look at what these drugs do in just a moment. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna talk about some desirable characteristic of antimicrobial drugs. And so actually what we're gonna do for this is I'm going to open up a discussion and what I'll have you guys do is in the discussion, I want you to come up with five things that you think would be desirable for an antimicrobial drug. For example, I'll give you one. The drug is selectively toxic. And remember that means that it, it's toxic to the microbe without harming the host. And so what I want you to do is I want you to come up with five other characteristics that you think would be desirable for an antimicrobial drug. If you were the one, if you were a scientist who was designing an antimicrobial drugs, what would be some considerations in choosing an antimicrobial drug? And so you're going to make a list on Canvas on another discussion board, and this will be a class participation assignment. After the date has closed for this, then I will post a list to summarize um, what you guys talked about and what are some desirable characteristics of antimicrobial drugs. And so this, this slide will actually be a class paper that will be posted on Canvas. So when we look at antimicrobial drugs, and this is something you guys have talked about in lab, and that is broad spectrum and narrow spectrum. And so if we call a drug broad spectrum, this is an antibiotic that is effective against a wide variety of organisms, both gram-positive and gram-negative. So a broad spectrum is an antibiotic that's effective against a wide variety of organisms, both gram positive and gram negatives. And so an example, when we talked about the Kirby Bauer, an example of a broad spectrum was norfloxacin. And you might recall that when we looked at norfloxacin's action, that it Bacteria, all of the six bacteria that we tested, they were all sensitive to norfloxacin. So that would be considered a broad spectrum. So it targets a wide variety of organisms. Now, in terms of broad spectrum, right, they target a wide variety of organisms. You might think, well, it's best to always have a broad spectrum because if we prescribe a broad spectrum, it's gonna target whatever bacteria is causing the infection, and we don't need to worry about what finding out which bacteria is causing the infection, 
But what you want to think about is that's not necessarily a good thing. Choosing a broad spectrum is not always the best course of action. Yes, if a patient has an infection that is likely to be life-threatening imminently, meaning they're in danger of dying because they're undergoing sepsis or something along those lines, right? If you don't have time to figure out the infection, then yeah, a broad spectrum might be the way to go. Because if you give the patient a broad spectrum, it's going to target whatever bacteria is causing the infection. However, there is a drawback to using a broad spectrum. And that is that if you think about a broad spectrum, they're effective against many types of bacteria. Is it only harming, or is, is the drug only effective against the bad bacteria? And the answer is no. It's not only going to inhibit the organism causing the disease, but it also has an effect on normal flora, and it's going to inhibit normal flora. And so not only are you getting rid of the bad bacteria, but you're getting rid of the good bacteria too. And so that's why sometimes with a broad spectrum, you get some side effects that occur after taking a broad spectrum. One side effect might be gastrointestinal distress, stomach ache, diarrhea, etc., because the drugs might be affecting your normal flora in the gut, which causes an imbalance and causes um, GI problems. Another one, if you're female, you've probably experienced this at some point in your life if you've ever taken a broad spectrum, and that is that by taking a broad spectrum, you might end up with a yeast infection. And a yeast infection happens because when you take a broad spectrum in the vagina, there's yeast and there's bacteria. When the bacteria are there, they're competing for resources with the yeast and the yeast are kept in check. However, if you take a broad spectrum, now you're killing off the good bacteria that's in the vagina. You're getting rid of the normal flora. The yeast is not inhibited by this broad spectrum antibiotic. And so as a result, when you get rid of the bacteria, not the yeast, the yeast is like, woohoo, freedom. It has resources, it has space, it has access to food. And so the yeast starts to overgrow and that's when you end up with a yeast infection. And so those are some drawbacks of a broad spectrum. The other drawback for a broad spectrum is what's called a super infection. That's this definition on the bottom. And a super infection is an infection following a previous infection, usually by a microorganism that has become resistant to the antibiotics used earlier. So basically you're gonna get a secondary infection. And so the super infection now the bacteria is resistant to the drug that was used previously. And so this is a big problem in terms of antibiotic resistance. By improper use of antimicrobial drugs or overuse of antimicrobial drugs, many, many things have led to an increase in the number of bacteria that are antibiotic resistant. And we will talk about these in a later slide. And so what you want to realize though is that yes, there's a purpose for a broad spectrum. If the patient's life is in danger, prescribing a broad spectrum might be the way to go. However, there are drawbacks because broad spectrums not only get rid of the bad bacteria, but they get rid of the good bacteria too. And so that would be a drawback of a broad spectrum. So now let's talk about a narrow spectrum. And so a narrow spectrum is an antibiotic that is effective against only specific types of organisms. And so an example would be penicillin because it targets 
peptidoglycan. and is effective against gram-positive. So penicillin would be considered a narrow spectrum because it inhibits peptidoglycan. And if you recall when we talked about the cell wall of gram-positive and gram-negative, Remember that gram-positive have a very thick layer of peptidoglycan, while gram-negative have a much thinner layer. So if we inhibit peptidoglycan, this drug is going to be more effective against gram-positive and less effective against gram-negative. And so that would be an example of a narrow spectrum. Another example of a narrow spectrum that we looked at in lab would be clindamycin. You might recall that clindamycin was very narrow spectrum. Not only did it just not did it just target uh, gram positive, but it was specific against Staph aureus. It did not target Bacillus megatherium. It didn't target other types of bacteria. It was only effective against Staph aureus. And clindamycin, as a result, is useful. It's used in topical acne products. It's used as a drug on the skin because Staph aureus, its normal habitat or normal flora, would be on the skin. And so clindamycin is used for acne because it's targeting Staph aureus specifically. So in terms of a narrow spectrum, right, the downside of a narrow spectrum is if you, if you don't know what's causing the infection, then giving a narrow spectrum might not be the way to go because in that case, it might not be targeting what's causing the infection. However, the plus side of using a narrow spectrum is that it typically targets the organism that's causing the infection. It's more targeted. And oftentimes you might get better faster as a result of that narrow spectrum drug because the drug is getting to the bacteria that's causing the infection and it's not being used up by other bacteria um, that are part of your normal flora. And so there are pros and cons for a broad spectrum and a narrow spectrum. If given the choice and you have time to figure out what's causing the infection, a narrow spectrum would be the way to go. But in some instances, you don't have a choice and a broad spectrum might be the way to go. And so this is just comparing the spectrum of activity. So if we look at these drugs, let's put on my laser pointer here. And so what you're looking at is the spectrum of activity. So we have our mycobacteria here. We have our gram-negative bacteria, our gram-positive, our chlamydias, and our rixedias. Notice that for tuberculosis, right, mycobacterium. Think about mycobacterium. Mycobacterium has a unique cell wall composition, and that is that it's made of 60% mycolic acid. So if we're talking about treating tuberculosis, right, TB, we can use drugs that target mycolic acid. And so drugs like isoniazide and others that we're going to talk about are effective against mycobacteria specifically but it's not going to be effective against gram-negative or gram-positive because they don't have mycolic acid in their cell wall. So that drug would be very narrow spectrum. Gram-negative, right? So notice that we have quite a few drugs that might be effective against gram-negative. So streptomycin, um, it has some activity against uh, mycobacterium. We have polymyxin. We have carpapenems, we have tetracycline, we have our sulfa drugs, our cephalosporins, a little bit in terms of penicillin, but not as effective. Um, and so notice that gram-negative have a lot of drugs that can be chosen. Some are narrow spectrum, so polymyxin is narrow spectrum. Look at tetracycline though. Tetracycline is very broad spectrum. It targets gram negatives, it targets gram positives, it targets chlamydias, it targets rixedias. 
penicillin is more narrow spectrum, right? It targets gram positive specifically. It might have a limited amount of effectiveness for gram negatives and maybe a little bit for the chlamydias, uh, but not very much. And so again, you don't have to memorize this, but it's just to show you that different, um, different antibiotics have different spectrums. Some are very broad spectrum like tetracycline, Others, like isoniazide, is very narrow spectrum. It targets a specific group of microorganisms. So here is a class paper. This one we will talk about together, so you don't need to do this um, on Canvas. But the question asks you, identify at least one reason why it's so difficult to target a pathogenic virus a protozoan, a fungus, or a helminth without damaging the host cell. So you wanna think about for each one, why is a virus more difficult to target without damaging the host? Why is a protozoan more difficult? Why is a fungus difficult? Why is a helminth difficult? And so what I want you to do is I want you to think about this and I want you to pause the video and when you're ready, push play and then listen to the answer. And so when you're ready, pause, and then we will go over this together. So hopefully you thought about this. Let's start with the viruses. So this is very relevant to what's going on right now in our life, right, the coronavirus. And there are several reasons that viruses are more difficult to treat. One is that for viruses, they live within host cells, right? They're obligate intracellular parasites. So because they live within a host cell, it's more difficult to target the virus without damaging the host cell because viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. The other thing about viruses that makes them more difficult to treat um, would be they are not living. They're considered non-living. We can't prescribe drugs that inhibit cell wall. Penicillin's not going to be effective against a virus because viruses don't have a cell wall. Viruses are simply a protein coat called a capsid and nucleic acid in the middle. In the case of the coronavirus, the coronavirus also has a structure on the outside of the capsid that's called the envelope. And the envelope is derived from the host cell membrane, meaning that when the virus goes to leave the host cell, it takes some of the host membrane with it. So as a result, because viruses are not living, you can't target necessarily protein synthesis. They themselves don't have ribosomes to do protein synthesis. They use host ribosomes. So you would also be targeting the host ribosomes, which would give you not selective toxicity, right? So viruses are not living, so we can't target cell walls. They don't have them. We can't target protein synthesis because they don't synthesize their own proteins, right? Viruses hijack host machinery. And as a result, right, if we were to try and target the things that allow viruses to replicate, well, that can be problematic because it's using host cell machinery. It's using our own cells in order to replicate. And so therefore finding drugs, antiviral drugs, is a lot more complicated than finding antibacterial drugs. Um, and so viruses, it's more difficult to target because one, they live within the host cell. So it's more difficult to target those without damaging the host. And two, viruses are not living. So we can't target cell wall synthesis. We can't target ribosomes because they don't use their own ribosomes. They use our ribosomes. And so viruses get a lot more difficult to treat. Now, if we talk about protozoans, protozoans are difficult to treat because they are eukaryotic. and 
animal like. So because protozoans are eukaryotic, they're going to have more in common with our cells than let's say bacteria. So we can't target peptidoglycan. They don't have peptidoglycan. We can't target 70S ribosomes. These cells are eukaryotic. They don't use 70S ribosomes. We can't target different types of metabolism because their metabolism might be more similar to ours. And so protozoans are more difficult to target simply because they are eukaryotic and they have more in common with animal cells. And the same then also goes for fungi. And that is, again, they're eukaryotic. And so because they're eukaryotic, there are less differences between fungal cells and our cells to exploit. So finding antifungal drugs is a little more difficult. And then lastly, helminths. You might recall back from chapter one that helminths are the parasitic worms, right? Parasitic worms. These are eukaryotic. and animal cells. So these organisms have a lot in common with our own cells because helminths are animals. So they don't have a cell wall. They're gonna use very similar metabolism that we do, etc. And so helminths are more difficult to target because one, oftentimes they're parasitic they're living within our body, and so um, targeting them specifically can be a challenge. Um, but the, the big thing about helminths is that because they're eukaryotic and they have, they're made of animal cells, there are less differences to exploit to find drugs that are selectively toxic. And so this is why targeting bacteria often is easier than targeting these different types of other uh, microbes. So question for you, one disadvantage to using broad spectrum antibiotics is that they, is it red, destroy normal microbiota, yellow are easily inactivated by the host, green are extremely toxic, blue target host cells. And so I want you to pause the video and when you're ready, push play and then we will go over the answer. So if you said red, you are correct. A disadvantage to using a broad spectrum is that they destroy normal microbiota. They destroy normal flora. They get rid of not only the bad bacteria, but the good bacteria too. And so that could lead to what's called a super infection. Yellow are easily inactivated by the host. That's not necessarily true. Being broad or narrow has nothing to do with how they're inactivated by the host. Green are extremely toxic. Again, that doesn't really have an effect in terms of um, selective toxicity. Blue target host cells. It doesn't mean that they target host cells. It just simply means that they target a wide variety of microbes. So now we're gonna look at the action of antibiotics. And we're gonna talk about how different antibiotics work to inhibit microbes from growing. So there are a variety of different strategies that antimicrobial drugs can employ to try and inhibit microbes. And so there are several ways that these can work. One is they might disrupt cell processes or structures of bacteria, fungi, or protozoans. So again, it might, um, it might affect the cell wall. And if you affect the cell wall, well, then the cells might die. And so disrupt cell processes or structures. In the case of viruses, viral drugs oftentimes um, inhibit virus replication. So it inhibits the virus from multiplying interferes with the function of enzymes required 
to synthesize or assemble macromolecules. If the organism can't make their macromolecules, therefore they can't divide. And so we're going to look at some examples of this, like targeting um, DNA replication or targeting protein synthesis. Destroy structures already formed in the cell. So it might be that it, it pokes holes in the cell membrane, for example. So basically, it destroys structures that are already formed in the cell. And so these are different strategies that antimicrobial drugs can use to try and inhibit microbes. So if we talk about drugs being bactericidal or bacteriostatic, again, we have talked about this in lab before, but if we say that a drug is bactericidal, cidal means kill. And that means that this drug is going to kill the microbes directly. On the flip side, if we say that a drug is bacteriostatic, static stasis means to stay the same. So drugs that are bacteriostatic inhibit microbes from growing. It doesn't necessarily kill the microbe. It simply stops them from dividing, which basically gives the immune system time to catch up. Um, and so it just inhibits the microbes from growing. And so in some cases, choosing a drug that's bacteriostatic might be more beneficial than choosing a drug that's bactericidal. And we talked about a group of organisms that we might not want to give a drug that's bactericidal. And do you remember what type of bacteria you might not want to prescribe a bactericidal drug? And that is, we talked about gram-negative bacteria, right? Gram-negative bacteria have an outer membrane. And in their outer membrane, they have LPS, lipopolysaccharide. Within there, they have lipid A. If a gram-negative bacteria ruptures, if there's a large amount of this gram-negative bacteria, and it ruptures and it releases that lipid A, lipid A is an endotoxin, and it might cause the patient to go into shock. And so in that case, if the patient has a large gram-negative infection, it might be better to treat it with a drug that is bacteriostatic to inhibit the cell from dividing, but not cause the bacteria to release a lot of lipid A. And so again, there are pros and cons for each type of drug. So this slide is basically looking at the action of antimicrobial drugs, looking at the approaches that we have to target um, bacterial cells. So the first one that we have is we have over here inhibition of protein synthesis. So inhibiting protein synthesis. There are several drugs that are used to inhibit protein synthesis. So we have azithromycin or a Z-pack, what we call a Z-pack. Clindamycin, which we've talked about is used topically um, for acne. Uh, tetracycline is one you've probably heard of. So there's a whole group of drugs and they work by inhibiting 70S ribosomes. They target 70S. Some of these drugs target the 50S subunit, so the large ribosomal subunit. Some of the drugs, like tetracycline, target the small subunit, the 30S. And so these drugs, though, collectively are used to inhibit protein synthesis because they target 70S ribosomes. Now, in terms of whether those drugs would be bactericidal or static. So if we inhibit protein synthesis, you have to think about, is it likely going to kill the bacteria or simply inhibit its growth? And the answer is that this drug is a static drug. It's bacteriostatic. It's going to inhibit the microbe from growing because without the ribosome synthesizing proteins, the cell is not making enzymes and therefore cannot replicate. And so these cl this class of drugs would be considered bacteriostatic. 
They inhibit the cell from dividing, but um, but they don't necessarily kill the microbe. So that's one approach. The next approach that we have is going to be inhibition of cell walls. So we have several drugs that can bl that block the synthesis and the repair of the cell wall. We have penicillin. We have cephalosporin. We have vancomycin, bacitracin, isoniazide. We're going to talk about all of these different types of examples here. But basically, these disrupt the cell wall. Now, isoniazide is going to target uh, mycolic acid. Penicillin is going to target peptidoglycan. And so they have different targets. If we think about um, inhibition of cell wall synthesis, would that be cytal or static? And the answer is that this type of inhibition would be cytal. It's going to kill the bacteria because bacteria are rapidly dividing. And if they're not able to make their cell wall to kind of grow in size, it's going to kill the bacteria. So this type of inhibition is actually going to kill the bacteria versus just inhibit it. It's going to cause the contents of the cell to come out. So inhibition of cell walls is going to be cytal. If we look at the third method, which is going to be damage to the cell membrane. And so examples of um, drugs that, that damage the cell membrane, um, polymyxin, the cholestins drugs, so daptomycin, etc. These drugs disrupt the cell membrane. And so if we disrupt the cell membrane, is that going to be cytal or static? And the answer is cytal. It's going to kill the cell. Because when you disrupt the cell membrane, when you get, let's say, holes in the cell membrane, that's going to cause the bacterial cell to undergo lysis. The next mechanism is going to be um, inhibition of nucleic acids. So we'll put here, so nucleic acids. So meaning that these drugs might target um, DNA replication. These drugs might target transcription. They're inhibiting some function of nucleic acids. So in terms of inhibiting DNA replication, an example of that would be the quinolones. So norfloxacin, that would be a quinolone um, because that enzyme, or I'm sorry, that drug inhibits DNA gyrase, which is an enzyme that's used to unwind DNA when bacterial, DNA, or when bacterial cells go to replicate. So basically it's inhibiting the bacteria from replicating its DNA. Other drugs like rifampin inhibits transcription. It inhibits RNA polymerase. So that's going to inhibit transcription. And so that will block the cell from taking the DNA and producing the mRNA, which is then going to inhibit protein synthesis. So is this mechanism likely to be cytal or static? And the answer is static because it's not, it's not disrupting structures that are already in the cell. It's preventing the cell from duplicating their DNA, for example, meaning it's preventing it from dividing to form two new cells. So it's simply just inhibiting cell division, but it's not necessarily killing the bacteria. And so that is the fourth mechanism, is inhibition of nucleic acids. And lastly, the last example is going to be inhibition of metabolism. So it's blocking some aspect of metabolism that's unique to prokaryotic cells. And so one way, one type of metabolism that we can inhibit is to target folic acid. Now we've talked about this over and over again, 
And that is that folic acid, right, is a nutrient that bacteria will produce and bacteria produce it to make nucleic acids. And so we talked about this when we talked in lab about the Kirby Bauer. We talked about this when we talked about competitive inhibition, right? So if we think of sulfonylamide, sulfa drugs, that class of drugs, remember, acts as a competitive inhibitor, inhibitor for an enzyme that normally converts PABA to folic acid. And so if we block PABA from forming folic acid, if sulfa binds to the enzyme instead, if the bacteria can't make their folic acid, they also can't synthesize their nucleic acids, and therefore they can't divide. Trimethoprim, remember, is synergistic with sulfonylamide because it targets two different steps in the synthesis of folic acid. Um, and so those two drugs both are used to inhibit folic acid synthesis. So along those lines, would you, um, would you predict that, that drug, these drugs are static or cytal? And the answer is static. Just like inhibiting nucleic acids is static, it inhibits the cell from dividing, it's not necessarily going to kill the cell. So the cell is not able to synthesize folic acid, they can't make their nucleic acids, and therefore they can't divide. So this class of drugs would be static. So the next class paper is again to get you thinking. For each of the following actions of antimicrobial drugs, explain why each mechanism is selectively toxic or is not selectively toxic. So I'm gonna do the first one with you. And then I want you to pause the video after I'm done talking about the first one. And I wanna see if you can think your way through the next four on your own. And when you're ready, push play to hear the answer. So the first one, let's talk about the first one. So inhibition of cell wall synthesis. So is that mechanism selectively toxic or not? So is that selectively toxic? And the answer is yes that type of drug would be selectively toxic because bacteria have a cell wall and human cells do not. So because our cells don't have a cell wall, if we inhibit cell wall synthesis, that drug is going to be selectively toxic because it's going to target the bacteria with our, without harming our own cells. So for the next four, I want you to think about are there differences, let's say for the next one, are there differences between the way that bacteria synthesize proteins and the way that we do? Is there differences in the cell membrane? Are there differences in terms of nucleic acid synthesis? Are there differences in terms of inhibition of synthesis of essential metabolites? So when you're ready, pause the video, see if you can think these through first, and then push play to hear the answer. So let's go over this. In inhibiting protein synthesis, is that selectively toxic? The answer is yes. Bacteria use 70S ribosomes and our cells use 80S. So these drugs are selectively toxic. They're gonna target the microbe without harming our own cells. However, there is a caveat to this, and that is where in our cell do we also have 70S ribosomes? So where else do you find 70S ribosomes? It's not just bacteria, but what other structure in our cells also uses 70S ribosomes? And you might recall that the mitochondria 
uses 70S ribosomes. Remember that mitochondria have some of their own DNA and they have their own ribosomes for protein synthesis. Mitochondria have 70S ribosomes. And so if the drug is very soluble and it can get into the mitochondria, then you might have problems with side effects. Um, the drug would not be as selectively toxic anymore because if it's inhibiting protein synthesis in the mitochondria, that's problematic. And so some of the drugs that are not as routinely used anymore are often because they have side effects that go along with um, targeting those 70S ribosomes. Because if the drug gets into the mitochondria and it affects mitochondrial ribosomes, well then that's not gonna be as selectively toxic anymore. And so there is a drawback, but we're gonna say overall that yes, this is selectively toxic because bacteria use 70S ribosomes and our cells use 80S. Next, we have injury to the plasma membrane. Is that selectively toxic? And as a general rule, no, because Bacterial cells, bacterial cell membranes are similar to ours. They're both a phospholipid bilayer. And so there are less differences to the cell membrane in our cells and in bacteria. And so oftentimes these drugs don't display selective toxicity. One of the things that you're gonna see is that oftentimes these drugs are used um, topically, meaning polymyxin is found in triple antibiotic ointment neosporin. It's used on the skin. And the reason that it's safe to use on skin is that your skin, right, the cells of your skin, your epidermis, are dead. So if you damage the cell membrane, well, those cells on the outside of your skin are already dead. So those drugs are more often used topically on the skin versus internally because these drugs don't have as much selective toxicity, meaning they could damage host cell membranes as well. Next, we have, so let me change my ink. Next, we have inhibiting nucleic acid synthesis. So is that selectively toxic? And the answer is yes. This is selectively toxic because bacteria have circular chromosomes. Whoops. Circular chromosomes and we have linear chromosomes so bacteria have circular chromosomes and we have linear chromosomes so in the last slide, when we talked about um, inhibiting nucleic acids, I mentioned that you can target a um, enzyme called DNA gyrase. And that is unique to prokaryotic cells because it's used to unwind circular DNA. We don't have circular DNA, no harm done, right? So the, this class of drugs would be considered selectively toxic. Then we get to our last one, which is inhibiting the synthesis of essential metabolites. And is that selectively toxic? Yes. Bacteria synthesize folic acid, but we get it from our diet. So if we take sulfa drugs or trimethoprim, those are gonna inhibit folic acid synthesis. 
but it's not going to affect us because we don't use enzymes to convert PABA to folic acid. We simply obtain folic acid from our diet. And so those drugs would be selectively toxic. So now we're going to look at some specific examples of the different mechanisms that antibiotics use to target microbes. And so the first mechanism that we're going to look at in more detail are going to be drugs that fall under the category of being inhibitors of cell wall synthesis. And so an example of a drug that inhibits cell wall synthesis would be penicillin. And penicillin contains a beta-lactam ring. And the beta-lactam ring... is responsible for its action. Needed, so need it to make peptidoglycan. And so what I mean by that is that in order for penicillin to inhibit cell wall synthesis, um, it must have that beta-lactam ring being intact. And one of the things that you're going to see is if that beta-lactam ring is broken, for example, there are um, enzymes that bacteria that can produce that make them resistant to penicillin. And one of the ways that they do so is by cutting the beta-lactam ring. So in order for penicillin to be effective, it must have its beta-lactam ring intact. So it's the beta-lactam ring that's responsible for the action of penicillin. The types of penicillins are differentiated by the chemical side chains that are attached to the rings. And so what makes these different organisms or these different drugs target different organisms is depending, dependent on these side chains. And you'll see this in a minute. The way that these drugs work is that they prevent the cross-linking of peptidoglycans. And so if they, if they inhibit the cross-linking of peptidoglycan, that's going to interfere with cell wall construction. And you can see in the picture on the right, you can see that this bacterial cell that's been treated with penicillin, the penicillin has weakened the cell wall and it's caused the bacteria to lyse. In terms of our penicillins, what, which class of bacteria would you estimate that this targets more? And that is, it's going to target gram-positive more and some gram-negative. And remember that that's because in gram-positive bacteria, they have a thick layer of peptidoglycan. And so because they have this very thick layer of peptidoglycan that's responsible for the structure of the cell wall, if we inhibit that cross-linking of peptidoglycans, that's going to damage the gram-positive cell wall more. So when we look at our penicillins, we can break them down into several categories depending on if they are naturally occurring penicillins or if they are partly synthesized. And so we'll start with our natural penicillins. Natural penicillins are extracted from penicillium cultures. And remember that this is a fungi. And so if we look at our natural penicillins, we have penicillin G, which must be injected, and penicillin V, which, is, which can be taken orally. And so if you look down below and you look at these two drugs, right, penicillin G versus penicillin V, notice that the common nucleus, the part that's in purple, is what they have in common. Notice that the yellow box is the beta-lactam ring. And then if you look at the side chains on this, one of the things that you'll notice is that penicillin V has this extra oxygen. And that extra oxygen is enough to make a difference in the way that the drug is administered. Because again, penicillin G has to be injected. It can't, it's not stable if taken orally. Whereas penicillin V can be taken orally. It can be um, 
it can go into the stomach and then be absorbed into the bloodstream and the intestines and then circulate through the body that way. And that's an important thing because when you think about drugs, administration of the drugs is important because it's much easier for a patient to be able to go home and take an oral medication than to require one that's injected. And so just these little small chemical changes make a big difference in how the drug is um, administered. And so these natural penicillins have a very narrow spectrum of activity. Again, they're gonna target gram positive. And so these have a narrow spectrum. Um, they target gram positive specifically. And the problem with the natural penicillins though is that they are susceptible to enzymes that are called penicillinases or more specifically, beta-lactamases. And these you're gonna see in a minute, these penicillinase or this beta-lactamase, those are enzymes produced by bacteria that make them resistant, so make bacteria resistant to penicillin. So if bacteria produce these penicillinase, this enzyme, ACE tells you enzyme, if they produce the penicillinase, they're going to be able to cut the beta-lactam ring. And remember that I said that the beta-lactam ring needs to be intact for its activity. And so these enzymes that bacteria produce, they can cut the beta-lactam ring, which basically makes bacteria resistant to penicillin. They are no longer inhibited by the penicillin because that beta-lactam ring is not intact for the penicillin to have its effect. And so one of the problems with the natural penicillins is that these types of penicillins are very susceptible to penicillinase and also its narrow activity. So if we look at our penicillinase, again, this is an enzyme produced by bacteria that allow bacteria to be resistant to penicillin. And again, it's because it breaks the beta-lactam ring. These enzymes are produced by many bacteria, but most notably Staphylococcus species. And penicillinases are also, again, called beta-lactamase because of their ability to break the beta-lactam ring. And so, again, what you're going to see is if you look at how penicillinase works, it's going to break that beta-lactam ring. And it's going to produce this penicillinoic acid, which is not active to inhibit peptidoglycan. It no longer is going to be effective to inhibit peptidoglycan. And so again, this is what makes bacteria be resistant to penicillin. So next we're gonna look at our semi-synthetic penicillins. And so semi-synthetic is just like the name suggests. It's partly derived 
from mold and partly synthesized. And so that's why it's called semi-synthetic. It has part of it that is naturally occurring and the other part has been chemically modified. And when they chemically modify it, they add or they adjust these side chains. If you compare that to penicillin G or penicillin V, you'll notice that the common nucleus, the part in purple is similar, but the chemical side chains are gonna be different. And what that does is it makes these drugs resistant to penicillinases, meaning that if bacteria are resistant to penicillin by producing penicillinases, you could still prescribe this drug to the patient and these drugs would be resistant to the action of the penicillinase. So even if bacteria is resistant to penicillin, they wouldn't necessarily be resistant to these drugs because they have chemical modifications. So that's one advantage, right? So one advantage is that it makes them, whoops, resistant to penicillinases, keeps erasing, or extends the spectrum of activity because remember that for natural penicillins they're very narrow spectrum they target gram positive specifically but when you take these uh, penicillins and you modify the side chains it now can allow the drug to have an extended spectrum of activity so not only is it going to target gram positive but if you look at ampicillin for example Ampicillin, because of its unique chemical side chains, has an ex extended spectrum. It can target many gram negatives as well. Oxicillin is still narrow spectrum. Uh, it only targets gram positives, but its advantage is that that group of side chains um, are resistant to penicillinase. Again, so even if bacteria is resistant to penicillin, it doesn't mean they're going to be resistant to the oxicillin. And so this is our semi-synthetic penicillins. So this is just kind of summarizing um, drugs that are penicillin-based and how they've been modified to make them more effective. So we have our penicillinase-resistant penicillins, methicillin, oxicillin, um, these two drugs specifically, are much more resistant to penicillinase than the natural penicillins. Uh, some of the penicillins, again, have an extended spectrum. That means that they're effective against gram negatives as well as gram positives. And so these are our amino penicillins. So ampicillin, amoxicillin. Amoxicillin is one they commonly use for kids when kids have infections. Um, it's a commonly used antibiotic. Penicillin plus beta-lactamase inhibitors. And so for these drugs, when they contain the beta-lactamase with them, the beta-lactamase is going to act synergistically. Now, you might recall that in lab, we talked about drug synergy, and that is that two drugs combined are more effective than either drug alone. And so when you give a patient a penicillin with the beta-lactamase inhibitor, that's going to increase its effectiveness because bacteria now are not going to be able to be resistant to the penicillin because the beta-lactamase inhibitor is going to inhibit that penicillinase. So an example of this um, contains clavonic acid, and clavonic acid is a non-competitive inhibitor of penicillinase. Remember what that means when we talk about a non-competitive inhibitor? it binds somewhere other than the active site. So it binds to penicillinase somewhere other than the active site. It causes penicillinase to change its structure. And now penicillinase is no longer able to cut that beta-lactam ring, and it's no longer able to inactivate the penicillin. And so a drug that is uh, penicillin-based with the clavonic acid one that you may have heard of or taken at some point um, is called Augmentin. It's a combination drug. It's two drugs together 
and they display synergy because you have a penicillin-based drug and the inhibitor of penicillinase. Now, in addition to having penicillin with the beta-lactam ring, we also have cephalosporins. And the cephalosporins are also derived from fungi. So produced by cephalosporium. fungi. So just like penicillin is derived from uh, penicillium fungus, cephalosporin is produced by cephalosporium fungus. And notice that it has a beta-lactam ring. And so the actions of cephalosporins are very similar to that of penicillin in that they both contain this beta-lactam ring. And so because they contain this beta-lactam ring, both of these are going to inhibit cell wall synthesis. Now, in terms of drugs that are cephalosporins, if you've ever taken like Keflex or Cefrazole, those would be examples of cephalosporin-based antibiotics. In addition to our penicillin-based cell wall synthesis inhibitors, we also have polypeptide antibiotics, meaning that they're protein derived. And these will also inhibit cell wall synthesis. So an example of this would be bacitracin. And bacitracin has a narrow spectrum. It's a topical antibiotic used for skin infections in post-surgical wipes, for example. It's used to kill gram positives on our skin like Staph aureus or certain Streptococcus species. And so again, it's very narrow spectrum. It's going to inhibit cell wall synthesis. It's also found in Neosporin. So if you've ever used Neosporin on a wound, the triple antibiotic ointment, one of the drugs that's in that triple antibiotic ointment, Neosporin, is Bacitracin. If you've ever seen the movie Big Hero 6, You've probably seen the part where he talks about how he is resist or how he is allergic to bacitracin. So that's what they're talking about is this type of antibiotic. Vancomycin. Vancomycin is narrow spectrum. It used to be used as a last line drug for MRSA. So MRSA stands for methicillin resistant staph aureus. When a patient had this methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, one of the first things, or one of the last resorts would be to give them vancomycin. However, now it's a first-line drug, meaning if a patient has MRSA, they will often go to vancomycin. And so vancomycin is important against MRSA. Now, the reason that vancomycin is not used uh, readily, meaning it's not like the first go-to drug for any infection, is that vancomycin tends to have a lot of toxicity, especially in the liver and sometimes in the kidneys. And so when patients are prescribed vancomycin, it might be that it's um, administered in the hospital, or if they do get to take it home, the patient might have to do um, liver screening to make sure to check for liver enzymes and making sure that the drug is not having um, a negative effect on the liver. The other problem is, is now we're also starting to see the evolution of vancomycin resistant or vancomycin intermediate Staph aureus, meaning that now Staph aureus is starting to gain some resistance to vancomycin. And so that's a very scary thought. What used to be our last line drug for MRSA now bacteria are starting to evolve to have some resistance against vancomycin as well. And so we'll talk about antibiotic resistance at the end of this lecture. So next we're going to look at our anti-mycobacterial antibiotics. And so for these, these are drugs that are gonna, it, are gonna target mycolic acid. Remember that for mycobacterium, 
they have mycolic acid, 60% mycolic acid in their cell wall. And so to target those types of bacteria is a slightly different approach. And so one drug that is antimycobacterial would be isoniazide. And it is used because it inhibits mycolic acid synthesis in actively growing cells. And this is used in combination with other anti-TB drugs. And TB, remember, is referring to tuberculosis. And so isoniazide is a drug used for TB because mycobacterium tuberculosis has mycolic acid in its cell wall. And so this would be a drug that is used to inhibit the mycolic acid. Another example would be a drug called ethambutol. And ethambutol is going to inhibit the incorporation of mycolic acid. And so it's a relatively weak anti-TB drug and it's usually used as a secondary drug to avoid resistance problems. So again, it's usually going to be used in combination with other anti-TB drugs just to help with um, avoid resistance problems. So you might have a patient that is taking drugs for TB and they might have a cocktail of a combination of drugs to try and target tuberculosis, which is, again, remember, hard to treat because that waxy mycolic acid is difficult to target. And so these are some drugs that are also inhibitors of cell wall, but they're not targeting peptidoglycan now, they're targeting mycolic acid specifically. And as a result, these drugs, again, are gonna be narrow spectrum. And they're narrow spectrum because they're not gonna target gram positive, they're not going to target gram negative. They're used specifically for mycobacterium. And so these drugs would also be considered narrow spectrum. So the next mechanism of action is for inhibition of protein synthesis. And so remember that for this class of molecules, for this class of drugs, these drugs are considered selectively toxic because these drugs target 70S ribosomes. Remember that prokaryotic cells use 70S ribosomes, our cells use 80S ribosomes. And so there are several drugs that are used to inhibit protein synthesis. One drug would be chloramphenicol. Chloramphenicol is gonna bind to the 50S um, portion of the ribosome and it inhibits the formation of the peptide bond. So it inhibits the peptide bond between forming between the amino acids. Tetracyclines. Tetracyclines will interfere with the attachment of tRNA to the mRNA ribosome complex. So it'll inhibit the tRNA from coming in and binding. Streptomycin is gonna change the shape of the 30S portion and it causes um, the code on the mRNA to be read incorrectly. And so it's going to inhibit bacterial protein synthesis. Now, again, remember that these drugs are considered to be selectively toxic because they inhibit prokaryotic cells without having as much of an effect on eukaryotic cells. The exception to that is going to be if they happen to uh, get into the mitochondria. Right, because within that organelle, if these drugs are very soluble and get into the mitochondria, it can inhibit protein synthesis in the mitochondria as well. And so you don't have to memorize all of these drugs and their action, but I wanted to kind of give you an idea of what types of drugs that you might have heard of would fall in this category of inhibiting protein synthesis. So Chloramphenicol, it's broad spectrum, it's inexpensive, but it's highly toxic and affects the formation of blood cells. And so chloramphenicol is not used um, as often anymore because of its toxicity. And so 
it's not, it's not used as often. We have clindamycin. Clindamycin, however, is narrow spectrum. It's used for acne. And you might remember when we did our Kirby Bauer test in lab that clindamycin targeted Staph aureus specifically. It did not have an effect on any of the other five bacteria that were tested, but it was effective against Staph aureus. And so as a result, clindamycin is used topically for acne. It's narrow spectrum and it's useful on the skin for acne. We have our aminoglycosides. Um, an example of this would be streptomycin. Um, it's toxic and can cause auditory damage, meaning it causes problems with hearing. And as a result, it's not uh, used as often because of that reason. We have our tetracyclines. Tetracyclines are broad spectrum. Um, they're useful because they can penetrate tissues making them valuable against rixetias and chlamydias, which are harder to target. But the problem is, is because they're broad spectrum, they can suppress normal intestinal microbiota. And so as a result, um, you might get side effects. Remember, we've talked about the downside of using broad spectrums, right? That if you not only target bad bacteria, but good bacteria, that that can um, cause either a super infection or cause GI symptoms, uh, gastrointestinal systems, because of an imbalance of the intestinal microbiota. And so tetracyclines or doxycycline, those are drugs that were used for acne, but again, there's some drawbacks to using those. We have our macrolides. So our macrolides would be erythromycin, azithromycin, clithromycin, Azithromycin, you've probably heard of as a Z pack. If you've ever taken a Z pack, that's azithromycin. One of the one of the benefits of a Z pack um, or azithromycin is that where a lot of times for drugs, especially like let's say it was amoxicillin, it might be a ten day course of antibiotics three times a day, so thirty pills that a patient has to remember. But for azithromycin the course of treatment is much shorter. So you take two pills initially and then one pill for a several days after that, and then you're done. It's a lot less number of pills for patients to remember and therefore can be better for patients who are more likely to forget to take their medication. And we'll talk about later that forgetting to take your medication or not completing a course of treatment for an antibiotic is not a good thing because when you do that, that's what leads to antibiotic resistance. Um, and so azithromycin has been used often for, uh, it's an alternative to penicillin and it's used often to treat streptococcal and staphylococcal infections. So to treat ear, skin, and respiratory type infections. And so a lot of times if you have respiratory symptoms, the doctor might prescribe you a Z-Pack. The problem is, is by overusing Z-Packs now, the azithromycin, we're starting to see a lot more resistance to azithromycin as a result because of its overuse. Anytime you overuse or overprescribe a medication, the more likely bacteria are going to become resistant to it. And so these would be your uh, macrolides. The next class of drugs that we're going to talk about are going to be our nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors. And so these are going to inhibit mRNA or DNA replication. And so an example of this would be rifamycin. And rifamycin is used to inhibit mRNA synthesis. And so because it inhibits mRNA synthesis, that is going to block the bacteria from making proteins. Rifamycin is useful because it's able to penetrate tissues. It does a really good job of getting into tissues, 
that um, are generally difficult to uh, penetrate. So it's used, for example, um, it can reach therapeutic levels in cerebrospinal fluids and abscesses because of its ability to um, penetrate tissues. It also then makes it useful for TB. So it has anti-tubercular activity. It's able to be used against TB. So we'll put used for TB because TB in that condition, the mycobacterium gets into the lungs and you get scar tissue that builds up and it gets walled off. But the rifamycin does a good job of penetrating tissues and makes it useful for um, TB. It's limited in its spectrum because it can't pass through the cell envelope of many gram-negative bacteria. So it's not very broad spectrum. It has a more narrow spectrum because it can't get through um, the porins, for example, in the gram-negative bacteria. One of the side effects of rifamycin is the appearance of um, orangish red urine, feces, saliva, sweat, and tears. And so that can be a side effect that can be a little startling to patients who are taking this. Um, and it causes this red orange appearance in various body tissues or body fluids rather. The next group that falls under our nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors would be our quinolones and our fluoroquinolones. Um, examples of this, naldixic acid, this is synthetic and it's used to inhibit DNA gyrase. Now, DNA gyrase is an enzyme used to unwind DNA for replication because remember that prokaryotic DNA is circular, eukaryotic DNA is linear. So bacteria have this enzyme, this unique enzyme, this DNA gyrase, to unwind circular DNA. We don't have this enzyme because our chromosomes are linear, and so this is why these drugs are, selective, are selectively toxic. Norfloxacin and ciprofloxacin, which we call cipro, um, they have broad spectrum, relatively non-toxic. Now that is a little bit debatable. Uh, if you've ever taken any of the floxacins, which fall under the quinolones, um, you may see a warning when you take those medications, and that is that they have a warning on them that they may cause tendon ruptures. It could be while you're taking the drug. It could be years down the line after you finish taking these drugs. So while oftentimes they're written as being relatively non-toxic, they do have some potential for toxicity. And so again, a lot of these floxacins have a warning about an increased risk for tendon ruptures. Um, I can tell you myself, I have taken moxifloxacin, which is Avalox, um, and I had some very odd side effects from taking that drug. I was hallucinating. I couldn't sleep. I had tachycardia. I had all kinds of really odd symptoms as a result of taking that drug. And once I looked into it, when I had these side effects, I found that online other people reported these same side effects. And so it actually probably is more common than we know. And so they were, I was prescribed the Avalox for a sinus infection and a later doctor said that was completely unnecessary. Like that was like hitting an ant with a hammer, using something very strong for an infection that didn't actually need that. Um, and so while the, this slide says they're relatively non-toxic, know that there is some toxicity associated with these floxacin type drugs.
Floxacins are used often for urinary tract infections, so UTIs, and for anthrax. So Cipro specifically is commonly used. But there are other drugs in that family of drugs that are used for the same purpose. Next, we have injury to the plasma membrane. And so remember that for this mechanism of action, these drugs are not necessarily selectively toxic. And that's because eukaryotic and prokaryotic cell membranes have a lot in common. It's much more difficult to target something specifically. However, these drugs can affect the synthesis of bacterial plasma membranes, so it blocks fatty acid synthesis. We have lipopeptide antibiotics, so daptomycin. This is produced by streptomycetes, which is a bacteria, and it's used for skin infections. It attacks the bacterial cell membrane, and it's active against gram-positive. Polymyxin B is also topical, so it's used on the skin. It is bactericidal. It kills bacteria because when you damage the cell membrane, it puts holes in the membrane, which kills them. But polymyxin B is effective against many gram negatives as well. And so polymyxin B is, again, one of the other antibiotics. It's combined with bacitracin and neomycin in non-prescription ointments. So again, in triple antibiotic ointment, neosporin, polymyxin B is going to be in there to target the gram-negative bacteria as well. Again, many of these drugs that inhibit the cell membrane, these drugs are gonna be used more likely topically on the skin because your outer layer of skin, your epidermis is dead. And so if you happen to inhibit the cell membrane on your skin cells, those cells are already dead. So not going to be as toxic to you as it would be to take these drugs internally. However, there are some uses for this. Um, they're also used to treat drug-resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa and severe urinary tract infections. So polymyxin B can be taken um, internally. Um, but typically it's reserved for if you have particularly drug-resistant um, infections. So again, pseudomonas infections or a severe UTI, then polymyxin might be taken orally. And then the last class is going to be inhibition of metabolic pathways. So inhibiting the synthesis of some sort of metabolism. So what we have here is we have our sulfonilamides or our sulfa drugs. And remember that our sulfa drugs will inhibit folic acid synthesis. And bacteria make their own folic acid and that allows them to synthesize their nucleic acids. It allows them to make their nucleotides. And so if bacteria can't make folic acid, they can't make their nucleic acids, and then they can't make their proteins as a result. Remember that the way that sulfonilamide works is that it's a competitive inhibitor for the enzyme that PABA normally binds to. So PABA is normally the substrate, and it binds to this enzyme, and it creates folic acid. Sulfonilamide is a competitive inhibitor. It binds to that enzyme and it prevents PABA from binding. And if PABA can't bind, the bacterial cell can't make that folic acid precursor. They can't make folic acid. They can't synthesize nucleic acids. And so these drugs work by inhibiting metabolism. They block bacteria from making folic acid. And so when they block bacteria from making folic acid, the bacteria can't synthesize their nucleic acids. And so these drugs are going to be bacteriostatic. They're going to inhibit bacterial growth. Again, what makes these selectively toxic is that for humans, we don't make folic acid. We take in folic acid from our diet, but bacteria are gonna synthesize it. So these drugs can be selectively toxic. Remember that sulfonilamide and trimethoprim, 
are sulfa drugs are an example of drug synergy. And they work together for synergism because they target two different steps in the pathway to block folic acid. And so when you combine the two, they are much more effective than either drug alone. Only 10% of the combined concentration is needed when compared to the drugs used separately. So you can give the patient a much, much lower dose by combining those two than if you were to give them either drug alone. This, this combination, this trimethoprim and sulfamethoxazole, this is used for urinary tract infections under the trade name Bactrim. So if you've ever taken Bactrim for a UTI, that's what it is. It's this combination drug of sulfa drug with trimethoprim, and they work by inhibiting bacteria from synthesizing folic acid. And so this is just showing you how these two drugs display synergy. So here is our sulfa methoxazole here, our sulfa drug, and here is our trimethoprim here. So what this is showing you is PABA is normally the substrate. So the normal pathway is the yellow. So PABA normally binds to an enzyme and PABA gets converted to dihydrofolic acid. Then there's another step where the dihydrofolic acid gets converted to tetrahydrofolic acid. And then the tetrahydrofolic acid is used to make the nucleic acids. It's used to make DNA and RNA. And so what happens is, is that the sulfa drugs are competitive inhibitors and they block the step from PABA to dihydrofolic acid because it's blocking the enzyme that would normally bind to PABA. Trimethoprim works by inhibiting not that step, but a different step. It is going to inhibit the transition from the dihydrofolic acid to the tetrahydrofolic acid. And so it's blocking its own unique step. So by combining these two drugs, it's more likely to shut down this pathway entirely because if, if one is not being as effective, the other one is inhibiting it at a later step. And so that's why these two drugs display synergy because they're working together to target the same pathway, but in a slightly different manner, a different step within the pathway. And so this is an example of drug synergy. And so this is looking at this example. Um, if you were to look at it on, let's say, a Kirby Bauer plate. So on the left, we have um, a disc that has um, the antibiotic amoxicillin and clav clavonic acid. So again, remember that the clavonic acid is the inhibitor of penicillinase. And we have another drug on the right. Now, what you can see is the dotted lines that are here show what the clear zone should be, right? So if you look across this way, that's your zone of inhibition. And so what that means is that if you also extrapolate and you go this way, the clearing should end where this dotted line is. But notice you have this additional clearing in between. That's the synergy. The two drugs combined are more effective than either drug alone. If we look at our example when we did our Kirby Bauer, here is your example of drug synergy. We have our trimethoprim and our sulfa drug side by side. And so notice that you would expect for this one, the clear zone would probably end somewhere around there. This one, the clear zone might end right about there where the dotted line is, but yet we have this enhanced zone of inhibition between these two drugs because those two drugs display synergy. They're more effective combined than either drug alone. So question for you, penicillin works by inhibiting blank synthesis. So how, what is the mechanism of action for penicillin? Does it work by inhibiting protein synthesis red, cell wall synthesis yellow, 
plasma membrane synthesis, green, or nucleic acid synthesis, blue. So you can pause the video, think about your answer, and then when you're ready, go ahead and push play. So if you said cell wall synthesis, you are correct. So penicillin works because it prevents the cross-linking of peptidoglycan. And so as a result, bacterial cell walls get weak and it causes um, lysis to uh, the bacteria as a result. So penicillin is a cell wall inhibitor. So again, this slide is just summarizing the five modes of antimicrobial drugs that we've talked about. And for each one, it gives you some examples. Now, when you're studying this, you don't necessarily have to study every single drug that I put in this um, in the slides. What you wanna focus on is use your study guide that I gave you to guide you for what drugs are important to know. So I'm very specific in what drugs I'm asking about specifically. And if there's a question that's related to the five modes of antimicrobial drugs, you might not, you don't need to say all of the drugs that are on the slide, but you should be able to give me one example of that type of drug. So for example, inhibition of cell wall synthesis, right? So in inhibition of cell wall synthesis, the example drugs for this, penicillin, cephalosporin, bacitracin, vancomycin. Those are all different examples of um, inhibitors of cell wall synthesis. They have different methods of action, right? Bacitracin is an amino um, based, um, a, a protein based type of antibiotic. Penicillin is derived from fungus. Cephalosporin is derived from fungus, et cetera. So these would be different examples of inhibitors of cell wall synthesis. Mechanism number two, inhibition of protein synthesis. So that is going to block proteins from being synthesized because it's going to target 70S ribosomes. So it targets 70S ribosomes. And so we have chloramphenicol, erythromycin, tetracycline, streptomycin, et cetera, azithromycin, right? These are all examples of inhibitors of protein synthesis. When you're studying this, you also want to know and review whether the drugs are bacteriostatic or cytal. So go back and review that as well. This, for this category, inhibition of protein synthesis, again, selectively toxic because it targets 70S ribosomes. Humans have 80S ribosomes. So just like cell wall synthesis, selectively toxic because bacteria have cell walls, human cells don't. Mechanism number three, inhibition of nucleic acid replication and transcription. So either they're going to block DNA replication or they're gonna block transcription. And so examples of this would be our quinolones, so like ciprofloxacin, for example, uh, rifampin, et cetera. These drugs would have selective toxicity because bacteria have to replicate circular DNA, for example, and they use different enzymes than, um, than we use. Mechanism number four, injury to the cell membrane. An example of that would be polymyxin B. Again, that's the one that's in triple antibiotic ointment neosporin. It's used topically. This category of drug is not necessarily um, selectively toxic. And again, because human cell membranes are very similar to bacterial cell membranes. And then our last one is gonna be our inhibition of synthesis of essential metabolites. So looking at um, sulfonilamide and trimethoprim, right? These drugs are going to inhibit the formation of folic acid. They're gonna inhibit the formation of folic acid.
And so bacteria make folic acid. So this drug would be selectively toxic. It will target bacteria without harming the host. So here is our class paper. Again, we're gonna go over the answers. So after, you, after I read the question, go ahead and pause the video and think about your answer. And then when you're ready, then go ahead and play this and um, get the answer. So what is the most common mechanism that a bacterium uses to resist the effect of penicillin? And so again, pause this, think about your answer, and when you're ready, come back and uh, listen to the answer. And so the answer is that bacteria produce penicillinase, which, not with, sorry, which, cut the beta-lactam ring and inactivates penicillin. So the most common way that bacteria resist the effect of penicillin is that they produce this penicillinase, they make this enzyme, which cuts the beta-lactam ring on penicillin and it inactivates penicillin's action. And so that is going to make bacteria resistant to penicillin. And again, at the end of this lecture, we're gonna focus on what are the other ways that bacteria become resistant to antibiotics? Because you probably know that antibiotic resistance has become a major problem. So next we're gonna talk about how we treat bacteria in biofilms. Bacteria in biofilms behave differently when they are free living. And so bacteria that are in biofilms are often unaffected by antimicrobials. Bacteria in biofilms, remember, are about a thousand times more resistant to antimicrobial drugs than bacteria that are not in biofilms. And so antibiotics often cannot penetrate the sticky extracellular material that surrounds the biofilm. So again, it, they have a difficult time getting through that glycocalyx. And bacteria in biofilms also express a different phenotype and have different antibiotic susceptibility profiles than free living bacteria. So there are several treatment um, strategies when trying to deal with biofilms. One way would be to interrupt quorum sensing, because remember that quorum sensing is the signaling pathway that bacteria use to attract other bacteria to the biofilm. And so if we can disrupt the quorum sensing, that helps inhibit the formation of the biofilm. And so daptomycin has shown some success with um, this mechanism. Also adding DNA to antibiotics aids in the penetration through the extracellular debris. And so again, it's gonna help break down that um, biofilm, which helps get the drugs to where the bacteria is. Um, impregnating devices with antibiotics prior to implantation. And so this would be a prophylactic way to prevent a biofilm from forming. Some antibiotics though, aminoglycosides, actually cause biofilms to form at a higher rate than they normally would. And so we have to be careful with which antibiotics we prescribe. So next we're gonna look at tests to guide chemotherapy. Before actual antimicrobial therapy can begin, three factors must be known to help guide the treatment. And so the first is gonna be the identity of the microorganism causing the infection. Because again, if we look at the spectrum of activity, penicillin is very narrow spectrum. It targets gram positive specifically. 
And so without knowing the organism that's causing the infection, if you were to prescribe penicillin and that patient has a gram-negative infection, that drug is not going to be effective against, um, that drug is not going to be effective against that infection. And so knowing what organism is causing the infection is important to help guide appropriate antibiotic therapy. And so again, we don't want to just prescribe a broad spectrum just because it's going to kill everything because there are side effects and there are drawbacks for using a broad spectrum. And so it's helpful to know the identity of the microbe causing the infection. Also, the degree of the microorganism susceptibility or sensitivity to various drugs. Because let's say we are treating a patient uh, who has a urinary tract infection. And let's say we get a urine sample from this patient and we take that urine sample and we swab it on a Kirby Bauer plate and we do an antibiotic sensitivity test. Well, you have to think that even if we know that the UTI is caused by um, E. coli, 90% of UTIs are E. coli, even though that's the most common bacteria that's gonna cause the infection, that still doesn't necessarily tell you how that particular bacteria is going to respond to the antibiotics because we have different strains of bacteria and they have varying levels of antibiotic sensitivities, meaning they have varying levels of resistance. So while some E. coli might be um, susceptible to Bactrim, for example, or Cipro, that doesn't mean all E. coli would respond. And so it's good to know the culture and sensitivity test, the uh, Kirby Bauer test, to know how that microbe responds to various drugs. And then lastly, you also need to consider the overall medical condition of the patient because different drugs have different toxicities. Like remember, vancomycin has liver toxicity. So you're not going to give a patient who has a weak liver vancomycin. It could do more damage than it would be helpful. So these are there are a lot of things that come into play before a physician prescribes an antibiotic. And all of, these all of these variables have to be considered before prescribing an antibiotic. You can't just prescribe any old antibiotic for an infection. You need to have some guidelines as to what drug should be used. So identification of the infectious agent should begin as soon as possible. It should occur before antimicrobial drugs are given before their numbers are reduced, right? Because once the number of bacteria in the body gets lower, it's harder to detect. Direct examination of bio body fluids, sputum, or stool samples is a rapid method for detection, right? So if we wanted to look at what type of bacteria um, is causing an infection in the gut, well, a stool sample would be the way to go. Or if I wanted to know what type of bacteria is causing the urinary tract infection, getting a urine sample would be the way to go. And so direct examination of body fluids. Doctors often begin therapy on the basis of immediate findings and informed guesses. And what that means is that they don't always perform a culture and sensitivity test. Oftentimes, they can make assumptions about what is likely causing the infection. If it's an upper respiratory type infection, it's more likely to be caused by gram-positive bacteria. So they might choose drugs that would be more common or would target those types of bacteria. Or if it's a urinary tract infection, it's more likely to be gram-negative, for example. Um, we'll learn in lab why that is. But that basically, um, so not always will the doctor do a culture and sensitivity. Sometimes they might begin therapy, like for a urinary tract infection, they might prescribe a drug right away before the results come back based on what is historically useful against the UTI. And then when they get the results back from the urine culture, 
then they might adjust if they find that the drug that they prescribed, if the bacteria is resistant to it, then they they might switch their course of treatment and say, okay, now you need to switch to this other antibiotic. So, but again, they often don't want to wait. If a patient has a urinary tract infection, they're often very uncomfortable and possibly in a lot of pain. And so making the patient wait several days to get the results from the urine culture in terms of what antibiotic to use is not always the best course of action. And so again, doctors sometimes will make informed guesses uh, based on the fact that it is a UTI and they might prescribe a drug that is typically useful, but again, still get the culture and sensitivity test to determine if that is the appropriate drug. Epidemiological statistics may be required, right? And so you really need to make sure to identify what's causing the infection in order to undergo the right type of therapy. So the disc diffusion method or the Kirby-Bauer, again, also known as antibiotic sensitivity, culture and sensitivity test, is used to determine the appropriate antibiotic for treatment. The advantages to using the Kirby-Bauer method is that they're the most common, it's easy, it's inexpensive, and very little skill is required. The test is highly standardized. You might recall that when we learned about this in lab, right, we talked about how this test is standardized, and that is that we use that mueller hinton auger and it's poured to four millimeters in depth to control for lateral diffusion. The plates are incubated at 37 degrees because that is like human body temperature. The pH of the auger is 7.2 to 7.4 to mimic the pH of the blood, etc. So this test is very standardized. It's consistent um, across different labs which makes it an advantage so that the results are fairly easy to interpret. What you would do is, remember, we talked about this in lab, right? You take whatever sample. So again, let's say we're doing a urine sample and you would swab the bacteria across the mueller hinton auger and then you would dispense those antibiotic discs. And so if we look at these antibiotic discs, right? Notice that for some of these discs, the bacteria grows right up next to the disc. Would you say then that bacteria are resistant to this drug or are sensitive to this drug? And that would be it's resistant, right? The antibiotic has no clearing, no zone of inhibition. It's not inhibiting growth. So what that tells us is that this bacteria is resistant to whatever this drug is. Notice that this disc has a very large clear zone. It has a large zone of inhibition. And so just seeing whether or not it has a zone of inhibition itself is not sufficient to tell you whether it's sensitive or not. Again, you have to compare to that standardized table. So just like we did in lab, if your zone of inhibition is less than 14 millimeters, for example, it might be recorded that the bacteria is resistant. If your clear zone is, let's say, between 15 and 17, it might be recorded as being intermediate. Intermediate means that it's somewhat effective, but not completely. And I'll come back to that in a minute. If the zone of inhibition is, let's say, 18 millimeters or higher, then we would report that as that the bacteria is sensitive to that drug, meaning the drug is effective and you get these very large zones of inhibition. So you would use this information on these plates to pick an appropriate drug because you would want that, um, that bacteria to be sensitive to your antibiotic. Now, if you have several sensitive drugs, then let's say you might pick the one that has a narrow spectrum so that you don't have a lot of side effects, right? If you are working with a bacteria that is resistant to 
many drugs. So you might recall that when we did our Kirby Bauer with Pseudomonas, Pseudomonas ruginosa was resistant to everything except the norfloxacin. The only thing that it responded to was the norfloxacin. So let's say you had a plate and for all of your discs, the bacteria was resistant except one. And let's say that that one drug has some effectiveness and it's recorded as being intermediate. It's not resi resistant, it's not sensitive, it's somewhere in between. What that means is if we report that the bacteria has intermediate susceptibility, what that means is that we would only prescribe this intermediate susceptible drug if there is no other drug that the bacteria is sensitive to or that there's no other usable drug that the bacteria is sensitive to. Like if the patient is, let's say, allergic to penicillin, but the bacteria responds to penicillin. Well, that's not going to be all that helpful if the patient can't take it. So if there's no sensitive drug, the doctor might have to choose to use the drug that the bacteria has intermediate susceptibility. But if that drug is the one that's prescribed, the intermediate susceptible drug, that would require a higher than normal dose. So either the length of treatment would need to be extended, maybe not a 10-day treatment, maybe it's 20-day treatment. Or if safe, the dose itself might need to be increased. But if you get bacteria that show an intermediate susceptibility, well, a higher than normal dose would be required to, um, to test this or to be effective. And so this is your Kirby Bauer. And again, you guys learned about this in lab. Now, there's another test that's useful for determining an antibiotic, and that is what's called, in, uh, what's called an e-test. And this is a gradient diffusion method. And so the way that this works is there is this plastic strip, this um, epsilometer, and it's coated with an increasing concentration gradient of the drug. So notice that whatever the units are, let's say that this is nanograms per microliter. I don't know what the concentration units are, but let's say whatever it is. So this is 256, this is 192. So notice that the numbers are getting smaller. So this number up here is the highest dose of the antibiotic. This number down here is the lowest dose of the antibiotic. So we have this gradient method, right? So we have decreasing concentrations of the drug. Now, when we use these strips, these gradient strips, they give us a little bit more information. And that is that this is used to determine what's called the minimum inhibitory concentration, MIC. This is the lowest concentration that can be used that would inhibit or prevent bacterial growth. So not only does it tell us just that one concentration, so the Kirby Bauer is like a yes or a no, this will actually tell you what is the lowest concentration that you can use that would inhibit bacterial growth. So it gives you an idea of what concentration would be effective to inhibit um, the bacterial growth. And so this is another diffusion method, but again, it's a gradient diffusion. It doesn't just say sensitive or resistant, but it actually tells you the lowest concentration, again, the minimal inhibitory concentration that that drug can be used. Now, in vitro activity of a drug is not always correlated with the in vivo effect meaning that you might do a Kirby Bauer test, right? An antibiotic sensitivity test. And you might see that on the dish that the bacteria responds to that antibiotic. But that doesn't always mean that that's what happens in the patient. And so failure of antimicrobial treatment is due to several things. Um, one could be the inability of the drug to diffuse into that body compartment. There are certain parts of the body that are difficult to penetrate. Uh, maybe the drug doesn't get to the brain or the cerebrospinal fluid or the joints or certain abscesses in the skin. 
etc. And so it might be that it's difficult to get the drug to where the infection is. There may be resistant microbes in the infection that did not make it into the sample collected for testing. Or it could be that bacteria had in the, in the tissue had evolved to be resistant during the course of that testing that you were performing. And so what you didn't detect before, now bacteria is antibiotic resistant, which might make the treatment that you use fail. An infection um, is caused by more than one pathogen. It's mixed, some of which are resistant to the drug. So you might pick out the bacteria that's the most um, prevalent in the infection, but there might be other bacteria that are in the infection that you didn't detect initially, and that other bacteria might be resistant to the drug. Or potentially, the patient did not take the antimicrobials correctly. So they didn't finish their antibiotic, um, they didn't take it um, at the proper spacing, meaning they didn't take it three times a day. Basically, the patient did not adhere to the antimicrobial treatment. And so as a result, the treatment has failed because they didn't finish their course of antibiotics, for example. So when we talk about drugs, we can talk about a drug's what's called therapeutic index. And that is the ratio of the dose of the drug that is toxic to humans as compared to its minimum effective or therapeutic dose. So basically, what dose you can give that's toxic compared to the effective dose. The smaller the ratio, the greater the potential for toxic drug reactions. So if we have a therapeutic index of 1.1, that's a fairly risky choice. That's not necessarily a drug you want to prescribe because it's almost as equally toxic to the person as it would be effective. So a very low therapeutic index is definitely going to be a riskier choice. A therapeutic index of 10, a higher therapeutic index, is going to be a safer choice because that means that it's not as toxic as it is effective. And so the drug with the highest therapeutic index has the widest margin of safety. And so again, that's important when you prescribe a drug, especially if you're considering the overall health of the patient, right? You don't, if a patient is already immunocompromised or is already in a weakened state, giving them some drug that's potentially very toxic is not gonna be the way to go because that drug could end up doing more harm then good. And so the next part is going to be looking at resistant to antimicrobial drugs. So this would be a demo that I would normally do in class, but I'll walk you through it um, even though it's not a large scale demo like we do in class. So what we're looking at here is notice over on the right, we have these resistant levels. And so if you think about bacteria in the body, even if you have, let's say, E. coli in the gut, not all E. coli strains are the same. They're gonna have varying levels of resistance. The green are gonna be the low resistance, the pink have the high resistance, and then there's levels in between. So I did this in rainbow order. So the green is low, the yellow is a little more resistant, the orange is a little more resistant, and the pink is the most resistant. And so before you take an antibiotic, right, your population, your microbiota, is a collection of these different types of microbes. Some have high resistance, some have low resistance, some are somewhere in between. And so the way I actually do this when I demonstrate this in class is I have a a plastic bin and it has these balls of different colors. So the green um, balls that are in the bin are super glued to the bin, meaning they're hard to take out. The ones with the, uh, or I'm sorry, the ones that are pink that have high resistance, those are the ones that are going to be tightly stuck to the bin. The ones with the low resistance, so the green, 
have a very loose adhesive, which means it's easy for them to come out. So you have your population. And so I did this, I represented this, that we're starting with an equal number of each color. So we have three oranges, we have three pinks, we have three green, three yellow. So that's your original population. Now, let's say that you have, um, let's say that you have strep throat, right? And strep throat is caused by Streptococcus pyogenes and it's a bacterial infection. And so you go to the doctor and the doctor does his, the throat culture. So they swab the back of your throat. They do the rapid strep test and let's say it comes up as being positive for strep. So what's going to happen is that once you, so you have your infection and after selection is referring to starting the antibiotic. So you start your antibiotic treatment, right? And so let's say that your doctor prescribes um, amoxicillin three times a day for 10 days. So you start taking your antibiotic. And let's say, you know, four, three days in, four days in, you start feeling better right? Your symptoms resolve, your throat stops hurting, and you go, okay, well, you know, I feel better. I don't need to finish my antibiotic. My mom and my sister do this constantly, and it drives me insane because they will say, well, I'm going to save it for the next time that I get sick. I'm going to keep this drug, and if I get these symptoms again, I'll just take the rest of this later. Think about what the problem with this is. Why is it bad to not finish your antibiotic? So if you have a population and it has varying levels of resistance, some bacteria is very highly resistant, some bacteria has very low resistant. If you take an antibiotic, which bacteria are gonna die first? The low resistance or the high? Answer is the low resistance are gonna die first. Natural selection. Bye-bye green ones, bye-bye yellow, and maybe let's say one yellow happens to stick around, right? So when you take the antibiotic, the weak ones are going to die first, the ones with the least amount of resistance. Natural selection, survival of the fittest, right? So the bacteria that have the higher resistance are going to survive initially, and so if you start your antibiotic and you don't finish it, you've killed off the weaker ones first, but you didn't finish your course of treatment, so you didn't get rid of everything. Because remember, your Kirby Bauer is assuming it's a certain dose, meaning the drug will be effective over a normal co course of treatment. If you don't finish that drug, you're not gonna kill everything. The stronger ones are gonna survive. And so what happens is, is that you, after selection, you end up with a new population. We have three pink ones still. We have three orange still. And we have one yellow still. So after selection, notice how my population has changed, right? All the greens are gone. Most of the yellows are gone. So the ones that were easier, if I was the antibiotic, so again, imagine I have my demo with my clear box and the different balls in it. If I'm not looking and I reach in and I grab those bacteria, the, the little balls, if I go to grab them out, it's gonna be easier to grab the ones that are loosely stuck to the box, right? The ones that have the weakest ad uh, adhesive on them. So if I'm randomly, I'm the antibiotic and I'm not looking, right? I'm just reaching in and I'm grabbing out the ball. I'm gonna pull out, I'm gonna kill off the weaker ones first, the ones that are less likely adhered to the box. So the green ones die off, some of the yellow ones die off. And so notice that my population looks different. Now I've gotten rid of its competition. I've gotten rid of its good bacteria. And so what happens is, 
is that after selection, those are going to go to reproduce. So now you end up, you have two yellows because each yellow, the one yellow rep, uh, reproduced. I'm going to end up, each of the reds reproduce. And each of the orange reproduce. And so look at the distribution of my final population relative to my initial population. So if I look at my final population, notice I have a lot more antibiotic resistant bacteria in that population. I have now shifted the frequency of the antibiotic resistant bacteria. And so I have basically helped the bacteria because by only taking the drug for a short period of time, I got rid of the weaker bacteria for them. And basically, now they have better access to resources, food, space, etc. And the ones that are resistant are going to survive and reproduce. And so this is why, uh, or this is how drug resistance can happen, is that if you don't take your antibiotics properly, right, or you're taking your, if doctors are over prescribing drugs, right, you're going to end up with a scenario like this. So several key points, though, when you're thinking about the evolution of drug resistance. The first one is that the antibiotics do not create the resistance allele. It's not because I prescribe penicillin that bacteria think about it and make a conscious effort to make a protein that makes them resistant to penicillin. That's not how this works. So the antibiotic does not create the resistant allele. The variation in resistant, resistance was already in the population. I already had bacteria that were resistant or during this simulation, the bacteria acquired the ability to become resistant. But it's already present in the population. The antibiotic does not cause the resistance. What the antibiotic does though, is the presence of the antibiotic caused the resistance allele frequency to shift. Whereas before the pink ones, we only had you know three out of 12, now we have one, two, three, four, five, six out of 14. So almost half of my population now is highly antibiotic resistant. So the antibiotics itself doesn't cause the resistance. So it's not like we should stop using antibiotics. That's not the point. The point is, is that it's misuse of the antibiotic or overuse of the antibiotic that is leading to antibiotic resistance because those bacteria are already in the population. And it's, if we use the antibiotic, right, and it's not used appropriately, that is going to help select for bacteria that are antibiotic resistance. And so now we see a shift in the population and now most of the bacteria that's present is now resistant to that drug. And so that is kind of an overview as to how antibiotic resistance um, evolves. And so there are four main mechanisms for bacterial antibiotic resistance, meaning ways that bacteria have evolved to um, make them less sensitive to a particular antibiotic. And the first mechanism for this is going to be reduced permeability. And what this means is basically that in this case, the antibiotic is less likely to get in. And this happens through several mechanisms. It could be that you get decreased expressions of these porins. And remember that porins are found in gram-negative bacteria in their outer membrane. And it might be that possibly the bacteria start um, or stop, I should say, producing the porins at such a high level. And because of the lack of porins, the antibiotics are less likely to get in. Another possibility for reduced permeability is that there could be a physical change in the porin protein uh, 
to reduce the permeability, meaning that they get a mutation in the porn that makes the antibiotic less likely to get in. And lastly, this could be a change to the cell wall structure. Um, and that can happen because maybe the bacteria acquire the ability to produce capsules or slimes. And remember that capsules and slimes um, help to protect the bacteria against antimicrobial control mechanisms. The second mechanism for antibiotic resistance is restricted access of antibiotics, meaning that in this case, although the antibiotic might get in, there are these efflux pumps, and these efflux pumps are basically these pumps, and this is the bacteria's way of pumping the antibiotic back out of the cell, meaning the antibiotic gets in, but now it's gonna pump it back out. Think of it, it's kinda of like it's a bouncer at a club. It's gonna push it back out and say, you can't come in here. The third type of um, mechanisms for antibiotic resistance are altered targets um, of the antibiotic. And so, here we go. And in this case, this prevents the antibiotic from binding to the target molecule caused by the mutation. And this can be seen for almost every antibiotic class. Um, an example of this is remember that we talked about that bacteria have an enzyme that converts PABA to folic acid. And remember that sulfonilamide, or the sulfa class of antibiotics, act as competitive inhibitors to PABA. Um, for, they act as competitive inhibitors for the enzyme that converts PABA to folic acid. And so in this case, um, the enzyme itself might get a mutation so that sulfonilamide can no longer bind and no longer inhibits folic acid synthesis. And so that's what we mean by we say antibiotic target site alteration. So that enzyme changes, that's the target site, and because of that, sulfonilamide no longer binds and it's no longer able to prevent the bacteria from producing folic acid. The last one is going to be antibiotic inactivation. And this can occur either through the degradation of the antibiotic, meaning that they might actually break down the antibiotic, or potentially um, the antibiotic becomes modified. And this, prevent, this modification might prevent the antibiotic from binding to its target. Um, for example, bacteria like Staphylococcus, for example, remember can produce beta-lactamases, or more specifically, penicillinases, and that those enzymes are able to inactivate beta-lactam antibiotics, meaning that they cut that beta-lactam ring, and that no longer allows the um, penicillins or the cephalosporins from being able to inhibit cell wall synthesis. And so now we're gonna look at how do bacteria come to be antibiotic resistant? Like how do they gain the ability to do these various things? So let's look at how bacteria acquire the ability to become antibiotic resistant. And the first is what we call vertical gene transfer. And that occurs during reproduction between generations, meaning going from one generation to the next. And so in humans and plants, this happens going from parents to their offspring. In bacteria, remember that bacteria don't reproduce sexually. Instead, they reproduce asexually, which simply means that they just make a copy of themselves. And they do that through DNA replication, meaning that they're gonna make an exact copy of their DNA to produce two daughter cells. However, the enzyme responsible for this is DNA polymerase, and DNA polymerase is not perfect. DNA polymerase during replication can make mistakes, and if it makes a mistake, it's called a mutation. And so a mutation 
can be a way that through vertical, trans vertical gene transfer, meaning again we're going from parent to offspring, and that mutation might make it so that they acquire um, the ability to be antibiotic resistant. Um, for example, this could lead to a mutated porin. Remember in the last slide, porins can become mutated and make it less likely for the antibiotic to get in. This can also lead to altered antibiotic target sites. So again, like the example when we talked about uh, PABA being used to make folic acid, it might be that you get a mutation in that enzyme that no longer makes sulfonilamide able to um, inhibit folic acid synthesis. And so this would be considered vertical gene transfer. The next one is what we call horizontal gene transfer. And this is the transfer of genes within the same generation. And so there are three main types of horizontal gene transfer that we will look at. The first is going to be transformation. The second will be transduction. And the third is going to be conjugation. And in the next slide, we'll talk more specifically about this. Now, in order for there to be um, horizontal gene transfer, again, it's within the same generation. And this is basically a way that bacteria can transfer antibiotic resistance genes from one cell to another. And these are typically going to be transferred on um, what we call plasmids. And you learned in lab that plasmids are extra chromosomal DNA sequences. And when we get to chapter 8, we'll talk more about what are called transposons, which are these jumping genes. And that these can be passed from one organism to another. And because of these resistance genes being able to be transferred, uh, this can lead to what we typically call superbugs which are bacteria that are resistant to a large number of antibiotics. They might be resistant to only one if they're not a superbug, or in some cases, some bacteria are resistant to many, many, many types of antibiotics, and those would be the ones that we would refer to as the superbugs. So, now we're going to talk briefly about the three types of horizontal gene transfer. And we will talk more about the specifics of this when we get to chapter 8. And so the first mechanism for how bacteria acquire um, the genes necessary for antibiotic resistance is through what we call transformation. And this is when naked DNA is transferred from a dead donor into the competent recipient. And so if we look, here we have our dead donor cell. And when this donor cell dies, it lyses open, and it might release some of its genetic information. And so if you look here, notice, so here are these DNA sequences, and one of these might be an antibiotic resistance gene. Remember in lab, when we looked at transformation, we treated the recipient cells with calcium chloride. That neutralized the charges on the DNA, and that allowed the bacteria to take up those DNA sequences. It wasn't from a living cell, it was from DNA that was simply outside the cell, and the DNA went in, and if it incorporated into the recipient cell, now the recipient cell has acquired the ability to become antibiotic resistant. The next mechanism is something called transduction, and transduction uses a virus, and specifically what we call a bacteriophage, which is just another name for a type of virus that infects bacteria. And the phage acts as a genetic vector, passing DNA from the donor to the recipient. And if that donor DNA incorporates into the recipient, that then allows the recipient cell to become antibiotic resistant. Remember in lab, when we set up a plaque assay, we used the T4 phage, and the T4 phage infected the E. coli. Now, during this process, it's totally possible for the bacteria to pick up some of the donor DNA 
before the virus causes the bacteria to lyse. So if you notice, here is this phage infected um, donor cell. And it's possible that during phage replication and production of new phage, that it might incorporate that antibiotic resistance gene into the phage genome. And then when that donor cell lyses and it releases the phage, and the phage go on to infect a new cell, now when they inject their DNA into the recipient cell to make this cell be a, a virus producing factory, it's possible that this antibiotic resistance gene incorporates into the recipient cell chromosome. And now that makes this recipient cell also able to be antibiotic resistant. And the last mechanism is what we call conjugation. And conjugation is going to be the transfer of genetic material from one cell to another involving cell-cell contact. So notice in the first two mechanisms, it's not that the cells come in contact. In the first one, the cell takes up DNA from the outside. The second mechanism, it was through a phage. The phage acted as a vector. The third one though, when we talk about our conjugation, now we're getting cell-cell contact. And so in gram-negative bacteria, there are plasmids that carry genes that code for the formation of sex pili. And remember that sex pili are projections from the donor cell that contacts a recipient and helps to bring the two cells into direct contact. And so during conjugation, when we get this um, plasmid, this plasmid allows the bacteria to produce the sex pili and then during replication of this plasmid, it might transfer some of that plasmid into the recipient cell. And now the recipient cell has the antibiotic resistance gene, and it might also have the gene that allows this recipient cell to produce sex pili as well and keep passing on genetic information. Most of you have probably heard about MRSA in the news before. And MRSA stands for Methicillin-Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And again, we pronounce that MRSA. And this essentially means that this strand of bacteria is resistant to many of the antibiotics that we have to treat this type of infection. This is the leading cause of healthcare associated infections, meaning that you acquire this infection while in a healthcare facility being treated for something else. According to the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, in 2011, there were 80,461 uh, cases of MRSA reported, and in 11,285 of those cases resulted in the death of the patient. The good news is that MRSA cases are starting to decrease in the healthcare setting. The bad news is that there have been 13 cases of what is called VERSA, which stands for vancomycin resistant staph aureus since 2002. And vancomycin is generally considered to be a last resort antibiotic for patients because it has high toxicity. However, some strains of staph aureus are now resistant to our last, our last resort antibiotic, and that's a scary thought. So studies show that about one in three individuals carry Staph aureus, shown here as these grape-like clusters in their nose and on their skin, usually without illness. About two in 100 individuals carry MRSA. And MRSA is typically spread from person to person on contaminated hands, skin, or objects. In the community, most MRSA infections are skin infections, like the one shown in the picture. And it starts out as a small and small red area, and it might turn into a painful, red, swollen, warm to the touch abscess that fills with pus in a matter of days. One of the ways that doctors can determine if the abscess is caused by Staph aureus is to swab the wound and then grow it on mannitol salt auger like we did in lab. The special plate, the MSA auger, is formulated to grow staph aureus taken from the skin. 
if you see growth on an MSA plate and it turns the auger yellow, then it's probably Staph aureus because Staph is osmotolerant, meaning it can grow on high salt and it can ferment the mannitol to produce acids, which causes the fennel red to turn yellow. And so you guys got to test yourself to see if in fact you carry Staph aureus as part of your normal flora. Now, that's to tell you if um, Staph aureus is present. If we wanna look at if the bacteria is antibiotic resistant, like to be MRSA, um, the wound is swabbed, and then an antibiotic sensitivity test will be performed like we did in the lab. Remember, we did our Kirby-Bauer test. If the bacteria grows right up next to the antibiotic discs, so as you can see here, as the bacteria grew right up to the disc, that tells us that the bacteria is resistant to the antibiotic, meaning that the antibiotic had no effect on the bacterial growth at all. However, if there's no growth around the antibiotic disc, then we would say that the bacteria is sensitive to the antibiotic. And so notice here, notice we have this clearing around the disc, which means that in this case, this antibiotic on this disc inhibited bacterial growth. Notice that if we look at the plate for MRSA, there's only one antibiotic that the, that the MRSA is sensitive to, so notice here, and that is the vancomycin. Now, notice that the growth on the plate is gold color, and its golden color is where the species name comes from, remember Aureus AU, because AU is the atomic, atomic symbol for gold. Now, although in the community, MRSA only causes um, typically a skin infection, in medical facilities, MRSA can cause life-threatening um, bloodstream infections or sepsis. It can cause pneumonia, necrotizing fasciitis, which is flesh-eating disease, as well as surgical site infections. And so in this case, MRSA can be actually quite dangerous. So this is a question to get you guys thinking. In addition to not finishing a cycle of antibiotics or taking it as prescribed, what else can society do to minimize the creation of new antibiotic resistant bacteria? And so remember we did the example in class about how when you don't finish an antibiotic, like let's say you were prescribed a 10 day dose, if you only take that antibiotic for let's say three days, well, then now you're killing off the weaker bacteria first and allowing the stronger bacteria to survive and you end up with a population that is more antibiotic resistant than the initial population. And so we wanna think about what else can society do to try and minimize the creation of new antibiotic resistant bacteria. And so I want you to just go ahead and pause the video, think about your answers, and then we will go ahead and talk about what these ways are. So when you're ready, go ahead and push play. So the first one that we will talk about is that one of the ways that we can prevent um, antibiotic resistant infections would be to prevent the infection in the first place. And so how do we prevent the infection in the first place? Well, this can occur through hand washing, um, proper food preparation, meaning to follow proper food safety, um, immunizations if, if possible. Um, and so if we don't get those infections, then they're not likely to become antibiotic resistant bacteria. The second way that we can prevent this is to prevent the spread of the infection. And so again, like in a healthcare setting, taking proper precautions to try and prevent the spread of that infection from one patient to another. And so that would be one way that we can help to minimize um, the creation of new antibiotic resistant. A third way 
is um, to track infections. And what that means is that the CDC, or the Center for Disease Control, um, begins to track these infections to learn how they spread, the risk factors for contracting the disease, etc. Again, to better study how to prevent the spread, like how do we prevent passing this from one patient to another? And that then allows us to take proper precautions. The next one is to improve antibiotic administration and stewardship. And what that means is basically this would be to um, help basically get doctors to not prescribe an antibiotic that is not needed. Let's say, for example, a patient has a cold. Remember that the cold is caused by a virus. Antibiotics are not effective against a virus. And so in some cases, patients will go to the doctor because they're not feeling well, and they might demand that the doctor give them an antibiotic so that they can feel better. And in some cases, it might be that the um, it might be that the doctor feels this pressure and just to get the patient to stop, they might actually prescribe an antibiotic when they know that it's not effective. And so it would be important to basically help to get the word out to physicians to really be careful with the way that they prescribe antibiotics. That antibiotics should only be prescribed when necessary, meaning that the patient has a bacterial infection. Um, and so, basically improving the way that antibiotics are administered. Last, uh, the next one is going to be to stop using antibiotics in livestock. And so in some cases, uh, farmers have been giving livestock, like cattle, for example, antibiotics, and the antibiotics um, help to protect them against bacterial infections. And it might actually allow the, the um, animal to become um, bigger in size in some cases, which produces more meat. And so a lot of times farmers will give preventative antibiotics to livestock to basically help with this. Now the problem with this is again, the more often you give the antibiotics to um, these animals, you also might lead to more antibiotic resistant bacteria. And then the last one would be develop, whoops, develop new antibiotics. and tests so that we have more antibiotics that can be used in cases where our bacteria become resistant to all the current antibiotics that we have. So question for you, if one measures a large zone of inhibition in the disk diffusion test, one can assume that the bacteria are red sensitive to the antibiotic yellow resistant to the antibiotic, green unaffected by the antibiotic, or blue are producing the antibiotic. So go ahead and pause, think about your answer, and then come back and turn on the video. So if you said red, that the bacteria are sensitive to the antibiotic, that is true. If you see that large zone of inhibition, remember that means that there's a big clearing around that disc. And if there's big clearing, that would tell you that the bacteria is sensitive, meaning that the antibiotic is effective to inhibiting the bacteria's um, growth. And so that concludes our video.
So when we talk about antibiotic resistant bacteria, um, among the most antibiotic resistant bacteria, there are what we call escape pathogens. This is a mnemonic device. So the escape pathogens include um, Enterococcus uh, facium, Staphylococcus aureus, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Acidinobacter uh, bumani, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Enterobacter species. These groups of organisms cause the majority of hospital-acquired infections with a higher mortality of patients, meaning these are the bacteria that are most likely to be antibiotic resistant and to have a high mortality rate um, in patients who acquire this group of antibiotic resistant bacteria. So these are very likely to be problematic. Now, if you think about the modern era of antibiotics, in the last, you know, 30 years or last decade, the number of new antibiotics has not increased at the same rate, meaning that we're not, we're not discovering new antibiotics at a very rapid rate, at very rapid rate. And so as bacteria are becoming more and more resistant to antibiotics, right? Because again, the more often we overuse the antibiotics, think of a Z-pack, the more often we overuse the antibiotic, the more likely the bacteria are to become resistant to those antibiotics. And so there are other types of strategies that are now being employed to try and inhibit bacterial growth without having the same level that the bacteria can become resistant. So basically, we're trying to take a different approach of targeting bacteria without bacteria becoming resistant to the antibiotics. And so one way that is being tested and is still undergoing um, trials is to use what are called bacteriophage. So what we call bacteriophage therapy. And the idea behind this one is that bacteriophage are viruses that target bacteria specifically. So these are viruses that infect bacteria and can be used to destroy bacteria. And so the idea is because they're not going to target host cells, they're not going to target your own cells, they're very specific to a particular virus. So their, their host, the virus might only infect E. coli, for example or they might only infect Staph aureus, or whatever type of bacteria the phage infects. So this gives you a more specific way to target a particular bacteria without potentially harming the host because the virus won't affect our own cells. And so a lot of work is going into um, looking at these different phage therapies to see if these phage can be used to target bacteria in the body. This is also an interesting way that people are also approaching food safety, right? Because one problem with food safety is let's say produce having microbes on them, right? And so before we give them to people to eat, we want to make sure that the food is as clean or as free of bacteria that are pathogenic. And so one idea is to treat food products with phage, and the phage would then kill the bacteria, which would make the food more sanitary to eat. So one alternative to antibiotics is to use bacteriophage. Use viruses to target bacteria. The next one is anti-quorum sensing drugs. So again, if we're talking in terms of biofilms, biofilms are going to, um, the quorum sensing is used by bacteria to recruit other bacteria to the biofilm. And so there are certain drugs that are being used to inhibit that quorum sensing. So to inhibit more bacteria from getting to the biofilm. We have fecal microbiota transplants. So a fecal transplant. And you might've heard about these. So let's say, for example, this is something that happens um, if a patient is undergoing 
um, antibiotic treatment for an extended period of time. Let's say that a patient had some bad infection and they were on a broad spectrum antibiotic for a longer period of time. Remember that the problem with giving a broad spectrum and taking it for a longer period of time is that it's going to not only kill the bacteria that are causing the infection, but it also kills the good bacteria, especially in the gut. The gut gets very affected by this. And so what ends up happening is, is when you take these broad spectrums and you get rid of the good normal flora bacteria, patients can end up with what's called a C. diff infection, Clostridium difficile. The bacteria was already in the gut, but when you took the antibiotics, C. diff, right, C. diff is harder to kill, endospores, etc. C. diff is harder to kill. Other bacteria in the gut are easier. So when you take a broad spectrum, you're getting rid of the weak bacteria and the stronger bacteria are surviving. And so C. diff infections are notoriously difficult to treat. It's very difficult to get rid of a C. diff infection. And so one of the things that they're doing now is a fecal transplant. So they might take fecal matter from somebody who lives in the same household who might have similar types of normal flora, and they're literally gonna take that fecal matter and they're gonna put it up the colon and put that back into the gut. And the idea is to try and replenish that microbiota with good bacteria. And these types of fecal transplants have actually been pretty effective in helping with these types of infections. And so it's actually a good approach to trying to restore that balance in the gut. Uh, we have antibody therapy. So giving patients um, antibodies against the pathogen, either the pathogen itself or um, against the toxin. So like for, um, for anthrax, for example, there is a treatment approved where they actually have purified antibodies that they give to the patients and the antibodies basically neutralize the toxin that causes the anthrax. And so that's an antibody therapy. You're actually probably hearing about this right now as well when you think about um, the coronavirus. One of the things that physicians are doing right now to try and help severely sick patients with the coronavirus is by using antibody therapy. They're trying to identify donors who have had COVID-19. And if that patient has gotten better, right, if they're asymptomatic now, they've, they've resolved their infection, then what they're doing is the people that have had it, they're getting plasma donations. So the plasma is the liquid part of the blood. That's where the antibodies are gonna be. If somebody's already had COVID-19, and relatively recently, they have a high concentration of antibodies in their blood against that coronavirus. And so what they're doing is they're taking plasma from people who have basically gotten over the coronavirus, gotten over COVID-19, and they're now taking that plasma from those patients. Those patients are now donors, and that plasma is being infused to patients who are just starting the infection of COVID-19 and the ones that are really sick to try and help fight off the infection and not have to wait for that patient's immune system to catch up. It's basically giving them a little edge to help fight the infection faster. And so that's a, an example of an antibody therapy. It's taking antibodies from somebody who's already had the disease, somebody who's already had COVID-19 and they have a lot of antibodies in their blood, and then giving that plasma to another patient who can then utilize those antibodies to fight off their new infection of COVID-19. And so that's another example of an antibody therapy. There are drugs that are being used to target biofilms and adherence. So either treating catheters with a certain chemical that prevents biofilms from forming or ways to prevent adherence of bacteria to surfaces, etc. And then the last one is a really interesting one. I got to see a talk about this. Uh, Bedella vibrio and like organisms, what they call balos. These balos are these small predatory bacteria and they target gram-negative bacteria. 
So like phage, they're very specific. They have a very specific target. And these are bacteria that target other bacteria. And so they actually penetrate, they're highly modal, and they actually penetrate the, the cell envelope of the gram-negative, and they start using the food of that gram-negative bacteria, and then it causes eventually that gram-negative bacteria to rupture. And so the idea is that we can use these other predatory bacteria that don't harm our cells, they're target our gram-negative bacteria, and use these balos, this predatory bacteria, to help fight off gram-negative bacterial infections that might be in our body. And so these are just some new alternatives that are coming in response to antibiotics because as we've been using antibiotics more and more, bacteria have continued to evolve to become resistant to the antibiotics. And so there are several new approaches that are, are being considered and being looked at as alternatives to antibiotics. And so you'll probably see a lot more of these come up during your lifetime. And it's something to kind of keep in mind and look for. What are some of these other therapies? How do they work? What is the advantage of these therapy, therapies, et cetera? So here are some additional resources to watch for antibiotic resistance. The first link I posted is a video that shows antibiotic resistance in action. It's a, a study that was done at Harvard showing that bacteria can rapidly become resistant to an antibiotic over a very short period of time. And then the second video is an animation that helps summarize about what causes antibiotic resistance. And so use these as a tool to help you study. I will also place these videos in Canvas for you to watch as well, but they're good examples of um, antibiotic resistance.